Okay, you guys. Thank you for coming to our first lecture in the series Contemporary Art Demystified. My name is Mary Ann Chapel. I'm the founding director of the Spaces Foundation. And our mission here at Spaces is to advance contemporary visual art and professional artists while embracing a vibrant arts community. And our vision is to see that the Sarasota area and spaces is recognized as a place where contemporary art and artists thrive. So we are here today um, to talk about contemporary art because we think um, we, that is a lot of spaces artists and the spaces board, um, think that contemporary art is often not understood and especially maybe in the Sarasota, Bradenton area, contemporary visual arts are not celebrated or um, as talked about as we would like it to be. Hence our vision is to see um, Sarasota as a place where contemporary art thrives. So we are also here as part of this Contemporary Art Demystified three-part lecture to discuss um, the MAID campaign. The MAID campaign is, was launched on August 5th and it'll go to December 31st. And the purpose of the MAID campaign is to specifically remodel this huge new space that we have. We're super excited to have a new gallery space. And we think that this space will be uh, one of the biggest art galleries in Sarasota. And we're different than many of the retail gallery spaces in Florida that you may know of, where there's a lot of artwork on the walls and the, those artworks pretty much stay on the walls um, while the gallery is open. Uh, we at Spaces operate more like a museum where we have a solo show that celebrates or promotes one artist at a time and we change the show every month so we take it down and we put it up and the art here is um, a little bit unusual sometimes a little bit different than what you might see at other visual art galleries we often have performance pieces or we have um, installation art so we really want to show new forms of art and often they have a deeper social meaning behind them it's something that might positively affects social change. So we look for artists when we're curating that have kind of, um, have something to show or a voice um, that needs to be hear, heard about a specific social issue. And we hope to bring those to light here. So the MADE campaign will help remodel this gallery and assist in our programs. And we have a goal of $20,000 and your ticket, your $30 ticket, believe it or not, is a huge help to us. No donation is too small. We'll accept everything to try to raise these, this $20,000 by December 31st. So what I'm going to try to do now is talk about the whole art history, our whole uh, world view of art from the beginning of time up to postmodernism in about 20, 25 minutes. So I'm going to be talking really fast and I'll probably stutter as I quickly move through slide after slide after slide. And the reason why we're doing this is to set up where does contemporary art come from? Um, why do we look at art at all? Why do we look at artists? Um, and I was just talking about how we like to show artists that are responding to the time that we live in today. And as we go through this really quickly, the whole history of art, you'll see that all art historical movements were responding to the time they lived in. Um, and I'll go through that as we talk and I'll try to bring up what's happened, what was happening currently at that time. So ready, here we go. You can time me and see if it actually takes 25 minutes. So we will start at the prehistoric time. Uh oh, I already have a kind of thing. Got it. <laughs> okay, here we go. So the prehistoric age started at about 40,000 BC and it went to about 4,000. Um, actually we use common era and um, before common era now and um, it's just a little art historical designation that was changed from, we probably know BC and AD more. Um, I'm already using up my time on too much information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, so up to the common era, uh, no, actually 
before Common Era and up to 4,000 before Common Era. So at this time, we're, we're looking at the prehistoric art, humans' earliest art forms. It was before um, any type of writing was created. Um, it was approximately 35,000 years of, of art creation. You probably know the Lascaux paint, pa cave paintings and different terminology like um, the Stone Age. Um, you remember the Venus of Willendorf uh, with a very rotund little figure. Um, and the prehistoric age encompasses this huge time period before writing was discovered. Um, but also, I'm pointing that huge time period up because things were moving really slowly then in the evolution of mankind. And as we go forward in art history, you'll see that evolution starts happening more quickly and more quickly, and artists are responding to that um, and moving as fast as they can to keep up. Um, so this type of art was, uh, this art period is known for documenting art from all over the world. So we have, in the prehistoric age, art from Australia, the aboriginals in Australia, um, the Americas, um, Africa, Asia, uh, and it accompanies, again, the Paleolithic time period up to the ancient age. So the next slide we have, moving into the ancient age, is the ancient I combined on this slide in the, um, for the um, essence of time, the ancient, the Greeks, and the Romans. So the ancient period is 4,000 BCE to 400 BCE. And then we went from 400 to 30 common era with the Greeks. And then with the Romans, we're kind of 30 to the year 500 common era. Um, we started with the ancients, and you can remember maybe some of your art history. I don't know if this rings a bell, but for me, it's the Mesopotamians, it's the Sumerians. It's, um, and in fact, this image here was the longest legal text we have from the Sumerian age. So as soon as um, uh, archaeologists uncovered um, these written documents. Art historians also started to document this ancient age um, as a new era in art form. So many of this was made to, and you'll see this throughout the, the 25 minutes that we're talking here too, that a lot of this artwork was made for political or religious propaganda, if you will. Um, they wanted to, the higher ups, the people that commissioned this artwork, if you will, wanted to enforce their ideological beliefs on, on the people that they were serving. Um, after the ancient times, uh, right at the end of ancient, you can kind of think of maybe the Egyptian sarcophagi. Maybe you've been to the Met and you've seen those beautiful golden masks of Egyptian pharaohs. That was all during this time. Think of the tomb of King Tut. Um, and then what particularly interests me, I have to mention that I'm an artist, I'm not an art historian. Um, I have my master's in fine art painting, so I'm a painter. Um, but I love art history and I have a minor in art history. And when I look at a lot of these previous artworks, it really informs what am I making today and why am I making it. And right when we move from ancient to Greek art, um, the Egyptians were starting to create a type of sculpture that we call the Kouros Man, and he's very stiff, and he kind of has his one leg forward. Um, and this Kouros Man was looked at by the Greeks, and the Greeks took it one step further, and they created the contrapposto. So you can imagine the Greek art, where there's just a little bit of twist and a little bit more of a lean in their foot uh, in these sculptures. And maybe you can even think of the Discolobus thrower, where the, the Greek um, Olympic Games were documented by some of these really more dynamic figural observations. And in my artwork, um, I look at the figure and I teach figure drawing. Um, so I really love to look at art for, for those reasons. But the Greeks were primarily documenting um, very clear proportions, um, looking at anatomy closer. This is called classical art, if you haven't um, heard that term. It's from the Greek art, where everything was symmetrical. 
The nude became very significant, as I said. Um, the Romans, it's very confusing. A lot of times people confuse the Romans with the Greeks. And you know that's really why we're talking about this. We're doing this lecture, because um, we know the art historical world is, is confusing. And a lot of terms get thrown about, especially contemporary art is confusing, right? So um, the Romans actually referred to the Greeks, and they emulated the Greeks, and they created a lot of sculptural similar to the Greeks. Um, but they kind of went away from the classical more into some political uh, propaganda. The Greeks were, were interested in the ideal, perfect uh, depiction of the human form, where the Romans were portraying uh, more political figures and had agendas that were more overarching to influence their people in this way. Um, and then if we move from, so that's the ancient, the Greeks, the Romans. So we're about now to the year 500. And the, the Romans and the Greeks set us up to the uh, medieval age. So we're moving now into the year 500 up to the year 1400, another big span of time. And during this era, we, we also had an evolution. But again, it's moving faster, but it's just about uh, 1,000 years compared to the 35,000 years of the Paleolithic age. Um, and during this time, it was the Middle Ages. So again, putting things in kind of a historical perspective. Um, during the Middle Ages, it's also known as the Dark Ages, we had the uh, Black Death or the Plague that was in 1350. Um, but up to the Black Plague, we had a, um, uh, an increase of prosperity and stability and things were looking really good and then suddenly the Black Plague hit and things got a little darker. And, um, but up until the Black Plague, the church was getting really rich. And when the church was getting rich and then the Black Plague hit, they had a lot of money to invest in art. So they started creating another type of, if you want to say, propaganda, um, which uh, would talk a lot about death and what happens in the afterlife. And it also during this time, we had a lot of pre-Renaissance artists that were starting to um, experiment and create new ways of painting. And again, me as the artist, I love the pre-Renaissance. I love the Renaissance. Um, the pre-Renaissance is a lot stiffer again. They, uh, they're doing painting on a two-dimensional surface. Um, but they still haven't figured out how to make something look completely round. But they did create a few things, like the contrapposto is happening, this Chimabui crucifix. Um, you can see the contrapposto, this big tilt of the hips. Um, and they were um, using work to in influence people to rely more on the Christian church, basically. The, the church was creating works to to push their agenda. Um, but this paved the way to the high Renaissance. And Giotto, if you know Giotto, he was another big um, fresco artist at this time, creating new inventions in how painting worked um, just in terms of formal elements. So we have the higher ups that are commissioning work, but then we have the artists who are really responding to what's going on at the time and how can I create new exciting work. Um, after the pre-Renaissance, we move into the Renaissance and the High Renaissance. This is 1400 to approximately 1600. And if you recall, the Renaissance is called a rebirth. So we'll see this again and again throughout art history that just like the Romans were emulating the Greeks and they had um, this idea of classicism and perfect proportions and the ideal kind of morally correct human being, also, the Renaissance was back to that um, idea of let's create the, the most perfect proportional painting. And Italian artists previously had used tempura or, um, 
um, frescoes and oil paint had just been invented, so the colors were more richer, the, the scenes were huge, perspective was uh, suddenly used much more widely, much deeper pa painting, illusionistic painting. Um, and you can see in this Raphael School of Athens how deep the perspective goes. So Leonardo, Michelangelo, they're all inventing these new ways of painting and really became famous during their time period because of um, these incredible, can you imagine going into a church in the 1500s and maybe not being able to read and seeing this up on the wall and going, wow, what does this mean? You know, and, and the church used that <laughs> to their full advantage. Um, so during the Renaissance, and we'll discuss this in other eras that we come to, um, that there's a lot of little pockets within the Renaissance. And I think this is where things get confusing in art history. So during the Renaissance, we had mannerism. Um, this was happening simultaneously. And once you start to study art, or even you know, just looking at art, you'll start to see the significant changes. So you'll be able to see a pre-Renaissance stiff giotto compared to a high Renaissance Raphael movement, uh, painting with much more movement. And you would be able to tell that mannerism has elongated finger, fingers, elongated limbs, much more graceful, much more elegant. Um, and these, uh, you, you remember maybe the Medici, they started uh, commissioning things for their homes and having these kind of more maybe risque paintings and more mythological uh, depictions in their homes. So um, I just wanted to bring this up because when we see in contemporary art, you'll see that there's a lot of different movements within the larger movement of contemporary art. And um, that this continues, there's, there's this response to what does, uh, what's happening in the world what's happening in society, and what is the demand? Who is demanding my paintings? Who are paying for my paintings? And the artists are responding to all of this simultaneously. And the idea of invention. So to go from the classical painting, that everything was as close as academically proportioned as possible, to exaggerated limbs and um, strange heads floating in space, for example, um, this is a new invention, like how can I push it? Again, contemporary art, how can I push the boundaries? Um, after Mannerism, we move into the Baroque period. In the Baroque period, we have these strong darks and lights, primarily invented by Caravaggio. Here we have Caravaggio, the calling of St. Matthew. The light here is really a indication of God or this higher realm coming back, coming down and you know, hitting St. Matthew and, and calling him to be of service. But that dark to light, that chiaroscuro, um, it was actually invented a little earlier, the chiaroscuro, where they uh, were actually even Giotto back in the pre-Renaissance was figuring out how to mold form from light to dark. But Caravaggio really pushes the limits on this and um, <clears throat> really uses this light to dark, so much so that everyone in Europe and Velazquez in Spain start to imitate his style, and it's called the Car Caravagisti. Um, we have Rembrandt um, and Vermeer up in the Netherlands, for example, and um, he took what was happening in the Renaissance, but evoked, it, evoked a much more sense of grandeur and drama with this dark to light. Um, there's an emotional exuberance, and really push the limits for this invention. So it's not just imitating light, but how can I make it even more exciting? And to talk about what was happening at the time, during this time period, we had the Counter-Reformation that was rebelling against the Catholic Church. And the Counter-Reformation was saying, you know, we have a new way to worship without all these bells and whistles, if you want. You don't need all the fancy paintings. You don't need all the fancy sculpture. And the Catholic Church was beginning to get concerned because people were going into this other direction. So they hired, basically, a bunch of painters to create this exciting new world to pull and keep people in the world of Christianity. So after the Baroque period, 
We'll move into Rococo. Rococo is again a little bit of an overlap from Baroque to Rococo, but Rococo is primarily, we think of it as more Northern Europe, more of the English and French. <coughs> And while this was going on with the church, the wealthy decided this painting thing is a really good idea. How can we decorate our ceilings of our, our homes, our mansions, our palaces? Um, how can we depict how fun we are, how light-hearted our life is? You know, it was a really a mirror to the aristocracy of that time. And you can see in this painting by Watteau, these are the people dressed in the time period, but they're frolicking by a lake, they're out for a picnic, they have their cute little dogs. So these people are wanting to see themselves in their work. Um, and so while maybe the common people, if you will, um, were interested in something different, we have art that reflects the time of the aristocracy, um, this, you know, period 1700s where, um, where the French were really rising, the French and English, but I'm thinking primarily of the French because I'm thinking what's to come, right? Does anybody uh, know? We have so many great movies now based on <laughs> Marie Antoinette and, you know, so while the French are frolicking and buying all these wonderful paintings and having them made, the common people are getting a little resentful of this and up comes the French Revolution. Um, but that's a little bit later. I'll just want to go through neoclassicism. So neoclassicism is the next phase after Rococo, the frivolousness of the Rococo. I want to ca call them the, um, the ones that commissioned the Rococo paintings. Uh, the painters were basically painting, you know, just like we do today, uh, where, where's the money? You know, how can I pay for my career here? I want to be a painter. So um, the Rococo were responding to, uh, to the higher echelons. And then just like over and over, this keeps happening in the world of art history, the neoclassicists were kind of rejecting this idealism or this, this nonchalant attitude of the aristocracy. And they said, we need something that's much more serious here. So let's get another, um, another bout of classical imagery in our, in our artworks, a lot of going back to the Renaissance type of ideals. They're, they're renewing themselves, just like the Renaissance did, all the way back to the Greeks. They want proportion. They want to depict a kind of moral correctness in their artwork, a much more serious. They, they thought art should be more about virtues rather than playfulness. Um, so a whole, a whole era of painting comes from this neoclassical era an attitude. Uh, this is a painting by David. He was a painter for Napoleon. As you can see, this is a, an idealized version of Napoleon crossing the Alps. Napoleon is a much smaller man, by the way. <laughs> They've put him on a small horse, and he is a large man, which is actually probably the opposite from life. But we, they were idealizing to also, uh, David was working to please his benefactor, Napoleon. Uh, but David didn't realize that how much this would change this, um, this age of reason when it culminated. Neoclassicism goes from this 100-year period from 1750 to 1850, but right at the end <clears throat> of the 1700s, we have the French Revolution. And David was responsible in his workshop for training a lot of other painters that would go on to paint a new category of art history. Uh, and we'll move on to that now. One is romanticism, one would be realism. So romanticism is from the 1800s to the 1850s. Um, this decade of, the, of romanticism had an emphasis on imagination and emotion. And again, it was a response to what was before. They were, the romantics were disillusioned with this, you know, very serious proportion type, uh, proportionally correct type of painting. They wanted something <clears throat> that was much more imaginative. And you had a lot of writing. Of course, as you study art history, we look at 
not only what is happening in the world at that time, but there's also literary movements. And uh, William Blake was a great poet at that time who was influencing. He had a whole group of people that you know, um, followed him around and supported him and listened to his poetry readings. Um, so as we move into Romanticism, you can see that there's a huge disillusionment with the previous era, the age of reason, and that it is a clear reaction against the French Re Revolution. Um, so kind of overlapping, or right at the end of Romanticism, we have realism, uh, another one of my favorite art history movements. In realism, a reaction against romanticism. Like, let's paint real people. What is all this fantasy? What is all this uh, focus on mythology? We need to paint what's going on. We need to tell people what's happening in the world today. Okay, getting goosebumps, and trust me, it is not cold in here. <laughs> but this is so meaningful to me, and I just love this. Um, the painting, you know, the people working in the field, picking up the wheat. And uh, one of our guys that works here, Michael, was helping me with this, and I asked him to research the name and, of this painting, and he put in women picking up wheat realism, and boom, it said the gleaners. It came up right away, which is so cool that it's just, you know, so well known and documented. But so these guys um, wanted to, to, to paint what was going on real life depictions, and also you have to imagine right now we're on the cusp of the industrial revolution. Things are just really, people are starting to invent things. The world is, is changing rapidly. And I mentioned, um, you know, how slow it was in, in um, ancient times and how slow it was during the Stone Age, prehistoric art. Well now, you know, things are moving along quite rapidly. And the, it, this is the wake of the um, Industrial Revolution. Painting is changing. Um, sometimes I even portrayed ugly people. And actually, we have to say that Caravaggio may have influenced them because Caravaggio were painting people in his neighborhood. The, the body, uh, when he would paint Jesus in, um, in the cradle, he would use a baby from his neighborhood with dirty fingernails and um, really amazing real life people. So, so that idealized version has come and gone and come and gone. Um, actually, I haven't seen it really come back after realism, the, uh, the idealization. I, I've, I've seen mostly since realizing, realism more invention, uh, a more response to what's happening in the world, more artists looking at a way to affect social change, as I started out with, you know, is what we want to do here in, uh, in the spaces art gallery. So, um, th yeah, they were confronting all kinds of ideal, is, I ideal body proportions and the in institutions um, and a nonconformist type of movement. So after realism, what you've all been waiting for, I'm sure you're, you know, clutching your seats, uh, we have modern art. So what happens in modern art? everything kind of starts breaking apart. And everything has been breaking apart since modern art. But we have the Industrial Revolution. Um, artists are throwing aside everything they've ever learned, and they're creating <coughs> artworks that are, um, are more experimentation. Because you know what, what we have with the invention and the Industrial Revolution, we have experimentation, right? People are trying to figure out how to make this world work better. Um, and then also the artists are experimenting with, how can I make my art more effective? Um, what if I do, uh, you know, like pointillism and put, you know, yellow next to red? Will that give the optical illusion of orange, you know, in a Seurat painting? Um, <clears throat> this is a Manet, Luncheon on the Grass, and you can see how distorted this is. This figure in the back is a large scaled figure, which doesn't really make sense. It doesn't fit on the picture plane correctly. In fact, the picture plane is tilted up and, and the figure is, this is kind of flat. So all of that deep space perspective that I was talking about since Raphael is 
is going out the window. Nobody cares anymore. We have a nude woman who's not idealized. She's all scrunched over, kind of naturally, um, looking us in the eye like, yes, I'm having a discussion here. You know, this is all, um, actually, it's all, um, to me, exciting and new at the time, but how brave these artists were to make something. And when I'm in my studio painting, you know, we have a term in the art historical world to look at artwork and we, we kind of say derivative. Is it derivative of something else? And not that that's good or bad, but many of us here at Spaces don't want to make derivative art. We want to experiment and make something new and exciting that's responding to what's going on in, in our day and age. And our next show that's coming up is Marina Scheltut, and she discusses uh, an event that happened during COVID. And it's an installation piece, and it has to do with the sacred space of the bathroom. And you'll see pink sinks and all kinds of strange artwork that's not the, the norm in Sarasota. So I hope you can join us for this installation piece by Marina Scheltut. But uh, the same thing's happening here in, in uh, the early 19th century. Um, so during this time period, we have the Impressionists, and I'll just go through it. So during the Modernist period, there's a lot of different pockets of art happening. We have the Impressionist, and I'm going to go through these really quick so that I can keep to my 25 minutes. Um, we all know the Impressionist. We have the Post-Impressionist. Um, things are getting a little bit crazier. There, thing, things are abstracting a little bit more. Uh, colors becoming a, way more inventive. Um, we also have Art Nouveau, these long, beautiful, curvilinear lines, kind of illustrative looking. You probably would recognize uh, Gustav Klimt from this era. Um, <clears throat> we have Fauvism really bright colors, um, bizarre, you know, she has a green, this is Matisse, women with a hat, there's basically a green stripe down her nose. We know that's a shadow and he's inventing, but the expressive color, the line, the um, totally flat compositions now, um, the work is getting more, it's breaking apart more and more and more. Um, so just like the Industrial Revolution is inventing new things, these artists are brave in inventing new things. And when I'm in my studio, this is reminding me that when people come in and they don't understand, it's because I'm doing something, you know, that maybe it's just bad art or maybe it's something new. I can't figure that out quite yet, but I love the experimentation. Um, after Fauvism, well, we have Expressionism, you know, Monk, The Scream. We have Cubism, of course, with Picasso, one of the probably best known names in the history of art world to the public. Um, <clears throat> really shattering the canvas now. I mean, Brock, I love Brock so much. Um, this is a guitar or a violin. Um, you know, looking at things from life and breaking it apart. Um, and again, he's saying, this is what's going on in our world right now. So <clears throat> we can see these artists are really pushing the boundaries. And then we move into surrealism with Dali, uh, focusing on dreamscapes and the inner psychology. And a lot of the surrealists started by, this is a very kind of controlled painting, but a lot of the surrealists were just doing automatic writing and automatic painting with their eyes closed and trying to um, depict what was going on in the unconscious. And now we move into postmodernism. And I'm going to let Catherine Bezura come up as soon as I just set her up a little bit. In post, the postmodern era, and again, all of this is a setup for why is contemporary art the way it is? And why does it look the way it is? And how are artists throughout the centuries actually doing something very similar to what we're doing in, in this contemporary art period? And it doesn't have to be as um, difficult or confusing as I think uh, we make it out to be. And hopefully this lecture will, will make you want to enjoy contemporary art more. But this is a late piece, late in the postmodern era. The postmodern era happened in the second half of the 20th century. <clears throat> 
and this is a cut piece by Yoko Ono, and I had the privilege of seeing a huge solo retrospective of Yoko Ono. I never realized how important she was. It was actually called the Louisiana Museum in Copenhagen. Uh, I was in Copenhagen for the show, and it blew me away, and I started buying books on her, and she was one of the first performance artists. She was fully clothed in a beautiful suit and sat on a stage and had a, pe a, a scissors in front of her and she asked the audience to come up and cut a small piece of her clothing away, uh, uh, clothing off and they could take it home with them. Um, and again, I can't say enough about the courageousness of artists to do things that have never been done before. Um, they're saying, a lot of people said that uh, this was a, a response to the Vietnam War. Um, she kind of said it was uh, about giving, giving and taking, and how artists seem to take, this is her, her words, so she wanted to give something. And then she actually got, like most artists, when they're inventing something new for their time, um, she got a lot of flack for this. So the Impressionists, weren't, if you go back to the Impressionists, they weren't allowed um, to show with the Academy, and they had to have their own show called the Salon of the Refusé, um, the refused or the rejects. They had their own reject show for the Impressionists. So the same thing is going on here. Um, basically, she does this piece, and the critics say she's perpetuating violence among women by doing this. And um, and in fact, many of the people seem to enjoy cutting right down to her private um, undergarments. Her clothing was um, taken off and she covered herself with her hands. Um, but this is the post-modern era, whether you think um, it was about the Vietnam War, and this is what we'll talk about with contemporary art. It's really how you see it and how you feel about it. All these states I'm giving you are subject to change. Art, art historians um, disagree on many of them and really, what this whole lecture is about, and the next two that follow this, is about how we can look at a piece of art and we can decide what it means to us. And we can place it in terms of the context of what's happening today or the context of where it came from previously. Um, but I think this is a really courageous piece. And so in this postmodern era, from 1945 to 1980, we have a lot happening just like the modern era. We have expressionism. This is an amazing de Kooning. I love de Kooning. Um, spontaneity, improvisation, huge scaled paintings. We have op art. Um, artists are creating colors based on optical illusions, uh, images that might appear to blur, et cetera, when they're up close. And then when you move away, they do something different. So really focusing on the optics of what happens the, to the eye when we, when we really look and see. Pop art. Catherine Brazora will talk more about pop art, using what's happening in the everyday in, in our artwork. We have our pauvre, use of soil and rocks and working with the earth. We have minimalism. Uh, um, you know, similar to op art, not so much focused on the illusion or the optics, but more of a, a minimalist canvas. Um, and then we have conceptual art, and there's more. And actually within each of these art historical movements, there's always movements within the movements. Um, but we just wanted to set you up before we dive really deep into our next lecture on focusing only on conceptual art, and Catherine and I have decided it's about the 1980s. Um, uh, we'll go deeper into exactly what we believe conceptual, or not conceptual, I'm sorry, contemporary art is. Um, but in this conceptual art slide, we just show you, now um, the image is totally taken away. The image doesn't matter at all. It's what is the idea behind the artwork? It can be a chair sitting in the room. And this is where we all go, why is that art? This is a chair sitting in the middle of the room. Uh, so this is where the viewer really needs to question. And we will encourage you throughout our lecture of contemporary art to question, well, why would somebody put a chair in the middle of the room? You know, like a start asking ourselves the hard questions. And that's what artists that I know, the artists of spaces, the artists that I uh, the artwork that I make in my own studio, I want people to question, why is that happening? What's going on here? 
often people want the, the little blurb on the side of the painting to explain it, and we do that because we think it is helpful. But instead of that, you know, maybe trying to ask the questions to yourself when you look at art and try to really dissect what could this possibly mean. I know instead of um, the, the opposite would be, I don't know, I don't get it, it's stupid, my child could do that, and moving on, we want to ask, we want to encourage you to, to ask yourself the hard questions. I don't get it, why don't I get it? What does it mean? And stay longer in the piece and really look at the piece. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna move on and let Catherine Verzura take over and she's gonna go really deep into postmodern art and talk about a few paintings from that time period. We're gonna try to put this on her. And as you can see, it was difficult for me. <laughs> and I can't wait to hear this. I'll turn this around, see if that works. Okay, thank you, you guys. Oh yes, we need that more technology pieces. Transfer. And I'll see you at Spaces. And here's Catherine Bazura. I didn't give an intro. I'll do it. So she'll introduce herself. I am so delighted to be here with my virtual audience and my, my in real life audience. I, my name is Catherine Bazura. I am an art historian. This, the people that we've been talking about, the ones that classify things and come up with all these fancy terms. But I've also been a gallerist and I have maintained a space, a gallery in Tampa. And art really is the river that runs through my life. I, once I found art history, I was sold. I never looked back. There's always an artist making work that I don't know about. So it's an endless investigation for me. I'm a curious bird and I love the challenge of contemporary art. And I am in the business of giving people tools with which to break down what they're looking at. But what Marianne said was everyone is gonna come to work with their own point of view. So I think one of the other things I do in art education, I'm a college professor, we all have to, have to make money, right? Painters have to make money, art historians have to make money. I am a working art historian, which is a rare bird indeed. Um, we we want to give people, young people, people that come to me, people of all ages, the confidence with which to sometimes confront, sometimes investigate, and sometimes just enjoy the contemporary art that they encounter, uh, whether these are in museums, in galleries, uh, increasingly on the streets. We have a really wonderful, vibrant global street art community that has um, blossomed over the last um, 25 years. So I'm gonna start with, I call him JP, Jackson Pollock. He is the linchpin, whether we like this or not, uh, of the 20th century, and he signals a change. And it is, it is uniquely his to seize based on his own biography. He's a very difficult, angry person. He struggles with alcohol, he struggles with mental illness. And when his works are seen in person, those struggles are, are right in front of you without narration and without imagery, which he does invent the next visual language after Pablo Picasso. So we say Picasso uh, disintegrates the image and allows us to look at things from many angles, which is the complexity of our lives. People are complex. We, we imagine them um, from different angles and they have different hairstyles and different outfits and so in our minds people are multivalent portraits so picasso aims to create that multi-sided dimensionality which is human life and existence and pollock really considers it to be a riddle an intellectual riddle to get past what picasso has done many of the artists are um, he did figure out a lot of things he was very prolific and he had a great circle of intellectuals around him to continuously drive him 
including his relationship with the painter Brock that uh, Marianne mentioned. So Picasso and his circle are directly influencing Jackson Pollock and this New York school that uh, happens um, right around the time of World War II. Jackson Pollock cannot serve. He's deemed unfit. So you have to imagine many of his friends are going to serve. And he feels left back, left out. And what he does with that time is, is really pretty extraordinary. So I chose the mural that he is asked and commissioned to paint by Peggy Guggenheim. And this is a big turn in his career. So he studies with Thomas Hart and Benton, which we consider to be an American regionalist or realist, and he paints cowboys. So how does a man go from painting cowboys to painting nothingness? Well, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens hour after hour after hour, isolation in the studio. He's going to see all the other shows. His uh, partner is Lee Krasner, who's also a painter and an artist. So she is driving him. They have to make money. Peggy's got some. So here you go, Jackson. You get this huge mural that she's going to put in her um, foyer. In it, there's a brilliant use of color. The critics loved it. It was very well received. It was a major talking point. And you have this person, Jackson Pollock, who's very uneasy with people. He becomes, his work becomes the center of, of socialness of society in New York, which makes, it sets him up for, for a lot of discomfort. So you can see his expression here, and it is believed that he, he hooks this whole image still on the word. So it hasn't gone to nothingness yet, but I love this precipice of nothingness because we're about to jump into chaos uh, when we uh, drop the nuclear weapon. So that signals a big change in the way everyone on the globe thinks about everything. So here we are. And he, he, there's an underpinning of his own signature here. And you can start to see it in the blacks. And it really helps when somebody shows you the way there. And I can almost, like, it's, it's how far you get from it. I can almost see it better on the screen, like the the swirling calligraphy of him um, signing it, and then covering that up, covering himself up for the mural itself. And uh, Clement Greenberg tells him, the critic, who's very influential, words and art, we have to give art, we don't have to, but we, as humans, we can't help ourselves, context with the text. So it's, Jackson Pollock's work exists, but if no one writes about it, it exists in a different way. So the, the critic, Clement Greenberg, who is just as influ influential on what art is made as the artists themselves, his taste, his drive, telling them what's going to sell, he says, it's endless. It's like wallpaper. It just repeats itself. And he loves that. He loves the endlessness that's possible with losing narration and losing imagery. Oh, sorry about that. My next pick to dive in to this really complex time of post-World War II. So we have the war, which upends all many countries' daily lives daily lives, and, and especially here in, in the United States. But for us, immediately after, we enter into a time of intense uh, prosperity. We are the winners, and it drives a tremendous economic boom. And I don't want to betray the humor in Rauschenberg, Robert Rauschenberg, and I love the local connection. Uh, he had a studio further south on Captiva. He uh, was very influential in setting up a gallery at what was Edison College, is now Florida Southwestern uh, College. And they, they remain loyal with their, uh, their shows and their content to the lyricism of, of Rauschenberg, the playfulness. So art doesn't always have to be serious. There is a lot of playfulness that you can't miss. Don't miss out on that enjoyment. And I say about contemporary art, if you walk up 
to this monogram. It's a great title. And I chose it because it's, it's always kind of irritated me. From the first moment I saw it, probably as an undergrad, which was you know 30 years after its making. So things that were made in 1990, I'm thinking now if I were to look at them, uh, it was only that much of a chance to really reflect on the history of post-war when we were all in the late 80s. It, it gives me this sense of being unmoored, and it, that's what it's supposed to do. And it really is no more complex than Robert Rauschenberg saying, I just tried to make something that didn't exist before. S say what you want to say about it. He also did car tracks over, like he made prints by running paper over with a car. They were having some fun outside, okay? That's what they were doing. Uh, he says to de Kooning, draw me something, Willem de Kooning, draw me something, and I'm going to erase it. And he did. He removed every line that de Kooning had left on the paper. It's famous, because there was a de Kooning drawing there, and now there's not. But we still revere the piece of paper. So Rauschenberg is challenging us. He creates a lot in different media. He's very playful. He loved music. And that legacy of that gallery um, down in South Florida in Fort Myers, it continues to impress me. They have a show coming up about the band Devo as a devolution because this is deeply what Rauschenberg was thinking about um, and working with uh, someone like John Cage. So I do want to say that music really becomes uh, an overlap with a lot of contemporary art. Jackson Pollock was very influenced by jazz. And once you know that, the atonality that musicians were beginning to experiment with, he's playing it, it's on his record player, he doesn't have AirPods. But um, it, it's when, when he's not painting and he's relaxing, he's listening to that record player and he's seeing music live and he's watching music itself break down as he is in his studio, um, further breaking down the image uh, in, during his work day, right? When painters are working, they're just in their studios thinking, thinking, painting, making mistakes, starting over. And another local connection and you know, I get, I get to pick what I talk about, which is wonderful in this life. Please work that out for yourself. Like, choose what you get to talk about, then your life automatically gets wonderful and better. But Rosenquist, he had a really lovely relationship with the University of South Florida. I, I was there for my undergrad and my master's, and he had a studio in a town north up on the coast called Arapica. And he had a big warehouse there, and he worked there a lot. Um, he worked with graphic studios, so he made prints. He was around campus. Uh, he starts out as a billboard painter, which I think is, is not, you can't deny this in his imagery. He's used to working really big. He's used to um, using commercial images. He's used to making things that are meant to appeal to consumers in this new broadening uh, age of advertising and marketing and, and making things that people want to consume. We still live in this era deeply, um, so there's no um, really getting away from the messaging that consistently makes us want to consume and buy and spend and be slightly different than we already are. So F-111 is both a beautiful evocation of popular culture and for a while, when I was a young scholar, we were dismissing this era as being not, kind of frivolous. And I just always felt like that wasn't fair because for this life that we, li that we live still today, we're in the great long peace, um, we pay for that with these military weapons. So you have this F-111, which the painting is as long as. And then on top of that, you have these abstract iterations of, of color. You are combining a nuclear burst with an umbrella, a beach umbrella. There's cigarette smoke, there's a hair dryer, there's spaghetti, all of these things. Th this, is, this is the America of 1964 as seen through the eyes of, of Rosenquist. And he keeps doing it. He works with patterning that sometimes obfuscates the slickness 
of the images that we consume, all of us, and the, num the number of images consumed in, in the 60s by people was much lower than the number that we consume. So by breakfast, I've probably seen 150 things. And if that, that's if I'm going light on the social media. So he's thinking about spaces that are paid for, spaces in which consumers look and are influenced. And there is a prettiness to his work that is, is intentional, but he always underpins the work with a serious social commentary that is not always um, as pretty as, as some of the things that are advertised to us. So there's another view of this, um, and it can be installed differently. It does come in panels, and um, when it is shipped, it, um, it can be rearranged. Uh, it, Picasso, the light bulbs, light bulbs usually evoking the sense of, you know, where are we going with this technology? And now we ask those questions um, about artificial intelligence. Next I have, sorry, uh, Andy Warhol. So Andy Warhol is, is a pop artist, he, but he, he pulls from popular culture in much different ways than Rosenquist. Andy Warhol is a great uh, illustrator. He's a great draftsman, and he does start out also in advertising, uh, making uh, beautiful little illustrations to sell women's shoes and these types of things. He's known throughout his whole, li his whole life as a collector of, of little things that he considers pretty, uh, even people. He collects a lot of people, and he works in a place that he calls the factory. And that tells us a lot about the philosophy of Warhol, what he's thinking. Well, I'm going to make my art in a factory. I'm going to mass produce some stuff. Even the idea of himself, I chose a self-portrait. This is an artist who is willing to reveal. Uh, I, I don't think you would ever find Jackson Pollock uh, putting a self-portrait out there, like his physical demeanor. It, it simply wasn't important to him. He had much, much more. Uh, interest in depicting his uh, deep internal struggle and um, his, his absolute shyness about being inside a human body. <clears throat> and Warhol himself um, considers, he considers uh, when he gets ready, he calls it, I'm gluing myself together. So he used um, wigs and he would uh, talk every day to his secretary and she recorded some of his thoughts for us about his own enigmatic uh, persona, and he's the person that gives us uh, the 15 minutes of fame. Everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes, and now in the age of um, the internet, we say, well, maybe everybody's famous to 15 people, and maybe we're beyond that. I don't know what we're going to come up with next with AI, but the way he thinks about consumers, the way he thinks about himself, he makes movies, uh, he makes music, he's in the magazine business. So now we have all of these ways in post-war America where artists are becoming personalities. And they, uh, they sometimes leverage that. One of the good templates for an artist as personality is um, the artist Salvador Dali. And we're lucky to have the legacy of the sisters that collected his work and the museum that bears his name in St. Petersburg. So Warhol, and when we, when we were setting up the slideshow, he, it's dynamically attractive, his use of color. Which brings me to Alice Neal in the 70s. So lots of um, culture wars, uh, racial politics, the Vietnam War, the 70s is going to see some economic crises. Um, I remember, you know, the lines for gasoline. And these were the, um, this was the aura of the 70s, you know, after the 60s and free love and then the 70s, the bicentennial coming in 76. But this is a woman that works really, I wanted to include her, because she is pulling a lot of the slides that we just saw. She's pulling from them. She starts working in 1920, and she works until 1980. And she never deviates from working with the portrait and working with people. She was just honored in 2021 with a solo show at the Met. And um, I, I, P. 
People Come First was the title of it, which I thought was really amazing. And she wasn't really well known while working, uh, but she, during the last decades of her life, uh, people started really recognizing what she had done over the decades of her career. She is using very much a fauvist sense of color. And fauves, I mean, fo to be a fauvist wasn't exactly a compliment. They were calling you a wild beast, right? I mean, maybe it's a compliment, but I don't think it was meant as one. So she is taking that wild use of color and very much Matisse inspired. I, I love the purple lines that she puts around her figure. I think, you know, if I was a painter, there's no way I could ever attempt, you know, wh wh where does the chair end? And then this other, these are both art critics. So she, uh, she very much considers the vulnerability of her sitters. She is a person who has encountered and lived through terrible trauma, but she manages to keep people front and center. And thinking about Caravaggio painting his neighbors, she paints her neighbors. She paints in all the neighborhoods in, in New York. She spends a year in Cuba and lands in New York in 1926 and spends the rest of her life painting there proudly. And these are, you know, and I just love the, her signature. Uh, you know, that's about how much of Alice Neal is here, but it is Alice Neal as an instrument for seeing people that is really what we, what we respond to uh, and why she has been welcomed into the canon of um, very important um, uh, American artists of this time. And I read one of her quotes the other day, and, and what she said was that through the rise of fascism that occurred before World War II, then the Great Depression, she's thinking about her life, and she's thinking about moving into this new com com I want to say computer, this new consumer driven society. She says, we keep denigrating the importance of the human being. And I want to keep that front and center in my life. So this is amazing that she is picked up and reimagined and reframed and put into our lives in 2021, um, just as we were battling with COVID and realizing how important we all are to each other these intimate relationships and the, just the body language. And, you know, look at the mannerism in those, uh, those elongated fingers that he sort of languidly lays across his lap and his, and his green glasses. So Alice Neal, to me, represents this time where artists are going to choose what they want to choose. This is their freedom. This is why we look to them. Uh, they are the leaders of um, thinking about things differently and experimenting and not being afraid to fail. And she reflects, when we look back now, um, the right, she had so many LGBTQ sitters, she had politicians, she had art critics, she had pregnant women, uh, she had children, and uniquely, no matter her sitter, you are still getting a story. And Alice Neal is, is letting us, is reminding us that it is through the artist that we can learn anew. We're always struggling with the machine. Uh, realism is a, is a wonderful movement, but it is in part a response to photography and the worry that the machine could do what humans had been doing, which is recreate the world. Well, you can, re, you can re, recreate the world but what is truth? And what we get when we have these conversations and we look at paintings and art and sculpture and installation is we have a chance to ask questions that don't really have answers. So that's why I stay with contemporary art. And just remember, it's like a person. An artwork is meant and created to have many layers. And it is unknowable unless you spend the time with it. It might reveal a little bit of itself to you, like a first impression, but it will reward you over time with um, many layers of meaning if you stay with the investigation and stay curious. And then the other caveat, there's so much art being created. If you encounter something 
that you don't like, please just keep moving because there's another artist out there that will blow your socks off. So it's been my pleasure and I can't wait to go on this journey with you um, virtually and in real life and see where we're gonna go um, with contemporary art. And we have a little teaser for 1970 to now. And we will, we'll call back to um, the artists that inspire. And, uh, and this is 1988. And just seeing this, this Michael Jackson, um, it's a whole other era, right? We don't have Michael Jackson anymore. There was a time that that was almost unimaginable. He was everywhere with Thriller and the jackets and Jeff Koons. We can see Jeff Koons kind of the same way. Um, he makes things that are both beautiful and sometimes um, terrible. <laughs> Just like real life. So that is, um, that's me. I'm gonna mic, I'm gonna mic off. It has been my pleasure and I'm gonna bring Marianne up. Okay, I'll leave it. Guys. We'll just turn it off. Hi, you guys. <laughs> oh, maybe they're cut off on the Zoom. Uh oh. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you for telling us. <laughs> it's like my students. Are you guys still here? <laughs> Oh, okay, great. I didn't see your pictures, which I was seeing before. Well, thank you, you guys, for coming in person. We really appreciate you coming here. And um, we'll open it up for questions. Does anybody have any questions about the history of art that's leading up to contemporary or the in-depth discussion that Catherine gave on postmodernism as we're kind of setting this up to uh, why contemporary art. So I'm not able to see, but I was able to hear. So if anyone has a question online, just speak up, or any of you guys in the audience, or comments. Thank you. Oh, Edwin has a comment. I've got 20 questions. Oh, great. We like questions. And so I'm kind of curious. First off, what do you guys think kind of drives that pattern you're seeing of the like back and forth between the novelty and the experimentation, the, the response back to classicism and idealized forms, and then you know what what do you feel is driving that? And then it kind of seems like you're seeing it in pockets here. Do you think it's inevitable that that's going to happen again? Can you? Uh, I, I can, well, let's repeat the question. The question is. Uh, I'll the, let Catherine answer. The pendulum swinging. <laughs> Of, um, of art making from the classics to the romantics, uh, we can see a binary opposition in our own society politically right now. We do tend towards that in crisis. And when you study art history, you study, well, this is why I was like, yes, politics, economy, power structures, um, you know, the social fabric, what are, what are people arguing about culturally? For a long time, it was religion and how to be moral. And we, we still are. So these, the pendulum swinging back and forth seems to be just a human civilization thing. And when you sort of can, in retrospect, understand when a civilization is about to die, they stop making art. There's just no, there's no room for it. With the Romans, you see uh, they go to the four rulers, the Tetrarchs. Things are not good politically, not good economically, not good culturally. There's natural disasters. And then the art just like changes because you have these really, really violent, cruel leaders. And so the art visually, I mean, I, I go from one slide and I'm like, whoa, look at this guy, like what happened? It's radical, the shift in, um, in representation. So art is really reflecting deeply what we're going through on several different stratas. I don't know. I, 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 know, I think we know now when we're hearing the 
clanging chimes of doom, but I don't know what we can do to stop it. We've never been successful. But we do, we do rise from the flame of our own destructive impulses. So maybe that's it. Maybe it's birth, rebirth. And this is what you see in almost all world religions, is this idea of, of a circularity. Good one, though. Yeah, really great question. And I was thinking about it in terms of what we see happening now, you know, in, in the postmodern era that Catherine was talking about, and then into the 80s, is a response to what society is embracing. And in the 80s is um, a, a time of self-discovery, right? So therapy becomes really important. Self-help becomes really important. And maybe even it's continued all the way up to 2023, where you know people are posting about themselves. We see their best faces on mm -hmm. Instagram. My, uh, I had a conversation with my mother about, you know, she's doing great. I saw her on Instagram. I'm like, that's maybe not really what's going on with her deep down, you know. So we don't really know the truth, but there is an, um, a kind of, it's even evolved to even more personal information being shared and this uh, both looking within ourselves and both trying to project this um, idealized version is kind of happening now on the internet if that's our art form. Um, but what I was thinking about also is that how things are breaking apart and, and artists are discovering, I can be a performance artist, I can be a painter, you know, really in contemporary art anything goes. You can choose any art form, you can choose any style, everything is kind of accepted. And we went through a period of realism in, in the art world, I think of William Beckman, mm -hmm. um, hyper-realistic. Chuck Close. Chuck Close. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who else? I just had a, a woman flash through my mind, a, a, a woman artist. But anyways, I think that that is still occurring, Edwin, that there is um, this idealized version. And, but it just doesn't change everything so that every single artist now will paint in this idealized way because now we were set free basically through postmodernism. And so I think while some people will continue to preserve that idealized version, I mean, we, we have artist academies. There's mm -hmm. academies all over Italy and France and in the United States and we have one, uh, the Miano Academy right here right. where they are painting just for the sake of beauty, yes. and there's no content whatsoever. Yes. I mean, they, they don't mind that there's no content. They really are interested in craft. So I think now, in this contemporary age, it's still happening, uh, this kind of movement back and forth from idealization to response to society and uh, more avant-garde work back to I idealization. Instead, it's happening all the time simultaneously. Mm. So I don't think we'll ever see one predominant art form again. I think those times ended you know, in the 1900s with modernism, mm -hmm. when we saw cubism at the same time as the foes, you know, as the impressionist, post-impressionist. Um, so that's why contemporary art is really interesting. Anything goes. Yeah, no rules. Yeah. There was never a direction meeting or anything that all the art was done. And I think that the art and the, uh, and the fashion is totally parallel. Yes. Mm. So we're talking about um, art and fashion. Yes. And many years in the fashion business, always looking to the art. Always. And they're running along parallels. Mm. But it, are you seeing in fashion now like a, a, a big kind of like chaotic explosion yes. with younger yes. makers? And there are many more ways to enter in to the conversation now. You can be an artist on TikTok, you know? And you know, if you're good at that kind of thing, I, I, one of the things I love to watch is a guy that has a color and then he'll just sit there and paint, he'll just sit there and make, mix it like, like a master, right? And then we get to sit on our couch and, and watch this guy mix paint. 
which would have been amazing if we could have done that with somebody like Turner or you know, who's going yes. out and grinding the minerals. So we're always about our tools. And that desire for the classics is usually a, a, a fear. When we see it, uh, we have it going on down the street at New College where there's been a complete takeover. We want to go back to a classic liberal arts education, which is code for a pretty conservative viewpoint about what that means. Some, some thinkers are not allowed and some are allowed because we're talking about right, correct, true, moral. moral, right. So I, I think, it you know, when, when we're feeling comfortable, we experiment more. It's almost like thinking growth mindset versus fixed mindset. When we're afraid, we, we back a little into that fixed because we're just surviving. Something that occurred to me also, and we'll talk about this when we get into the other lectures, but what's driving the contemporary art world is the market. Oh. So we are into this strange Money. phenomenon where artworks are millions and millions of dollars, completely unattainable, and not even being able to be viewed by the public. You know, they, they yeah. go mostly, because museums can't even afford them, so they're going into private homes. And um, so that's what we're seeing as the current art trend. So it's really questionable. Is this a current art trend, or is this just what's selling and now what we think of, you know, what used to be the critics, who's making these decisions? It is Gagosian, mm -hmm. you know, it is the big art world, um, art gallery, you know, mega galleries that are, are producing work. And I call them a cabal. The cabal, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're setting what is happening in the world right now. So, you know, if a realist painter sells well, or if they're promoting them, you know, that, and they sell well, then that's what's hot, you know? So it's, it's really interesting, because the whole world has kind of become market-driven, and some artists are making, like Murakami is putting his images on handbags, yeah. and Louis Vuitton is working with artists, going back to Dasha's, you know, comment about fashion paralleling. Um, so there's a lot of other, um, influences on what artists make today, and it's a really good and interesting question that we can explore yeah. as we go through. We're going to have another discussion on lecture two just on contemporary art starting in the 80s, and then the third. Um, so there's two more lectures in the series. We hope you can join us either online or in person here at the gallery and see our new gallery space. And we really appreciate your support because, like I said, your ticket goes towards the MADE campaign and we need help to remodel this fabulous new space that we're in. So we will see you here. Is there any lasting, anything from online? Hi, Sarah. It's a really good question. Sarah is asking from Zoom, what was it in the previous art historical movements that created the trends and made all artists, so-called, follow those trends? Or maybe not all artists, but there was a bigger art movement with a specific stylistic trend that I went through earlier. Are uh, you wanna shoot uh, I first? think it is, well, people of the past did not have a sense of self the way that we do. So we have to unmoor ourselves from this, you know, social media based, I have a persona, I have a brand, I have a way of moving through the world as myself. There simply wasn't that construction uh, psychologically. So there was a lack of freedom. Uh, and also you were kind of born, geography was your destiny and so was social class. And the church made many of the rules, many of them. And you were very constricted by who was going to support you and the rules and mores of the day, which were up until, you know, we're, we're talking 
like the freedom that women have to move around without gloves, without a hat, without stockings, that's right at the beginning, you know, that's Jackson Pollock era. So um, it, is, it, is a, it is a personal freedom and a, a reframing of the conceptualization of self and free will that allows some of the things to happen that happen. Art for art's sake is really a conceit of this century, mostly. When we think about Picasso, he was very motivated by changing the way that the world felt about itself politically. He's, um, you know, bombs are exploding. Uh, and, and his own sense of self is, is really what a lot of artists put mirror their own identities after. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I work, I'm myself, you have to take me or leave me. Mm -hmm. I may have problematic relationships with women, but that's just who I am, mm -hmm. right? And then artists didn't even wear jeans. They all wore suits <laughs> and ties to paint until Jackson Pollock institutes the, the, um, the uniform of the black jeans and the work boots and the t-shirt. That was radical. So just even the freedom to move around and the clothes that were worn. I think also that um, in the previous art historical movements that we were discussing, and Catherine hit on this, it was an elite yeah. proposition. You Very. were trained pretty much as a child to become that. Your parents paid for your education. They knew you were gonna become an artist. Um, you trained in an academy under another artist. You were affluent, lived in an area where you had benefits that um, only people that lived in that affluent society had. Um, the masses were not making art. Today, you have the masses making art. Yeah. Um, so it was a few select group that could designate, this is what we're calling, uh, pick one, realism, um, you know, any of the previous styles. I'm trying to go back in time here. <laughs> you can never go back me. in time. <laughs> here, do that here we're going. There you go. Over well, before Impressionist, even. So I would say right around modernism is when that started to fall apart. But for sure, the neoclassicists. And they were intelligences. They were mm -hmm. meeting in cafes. They were having their own. I love that, and that's what we're trying yeah. to create here. Yeah. <laughs> you know that we can the have, salons. yeah, great right. discussions about art. But it was a, a very few uh, select group that were setting those trends, Sarah. So, great, thank you. Sure. Great question. Well, we're about to wrap up now. I appreciate you guys coming. I appreciate you being online. I hope you can maybe go on the computer and help us with the MAID campaign. If anybody hasn't yet given, uh, any amount is um, accepted. And we have different levels from $25 to $500. We'll put your name on the wall of appreciation that we have here. So you'll see your name in the gallery. And then we have naming for $1,000 and up. So for $1,000, your name would get designated to one of our studios. We'll name a studio after you and et cetera, et cetera. You can find all of this on our spaces.art, A-R-T website. And again, we appreciate any level and we appreciate you being a member and we appreciate you coming today. Thanks for listening. I know I, I got a lot out of it. Yeah, <laughs>